Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Dementia SA's webinar with Dr. D. We are coming at you live from Bahrain Estate in Cryfontaine. And Dr. D, thank you so much. Thank you so much humbly from all of us at Dementia SA for taking your time and, and, and coming through to us. Um, Dr. D. So Dr. D is a clinical and organizational psychologist with over 30 years of experience in hospital, private and corporate practice. She's an internationally recognized and respected inspirational speaker, an expert in personal development and human relations and has addressed over 100,000 people and facilitated and facilitated workshops in 57 countries. Dr. D also serves as a mediator, facilitator and executive coach. Entertaining, dynamic, and knowledgeable, Dr. D is a household name in South Africa who regularly appears on TV and radio and is quoted in the press and print media. She was the media psychologist for the Oscar Pretoria trial, and currently she hosts her weekly podcast, Thrive, with Dr. D and her live show, Coffee and Connect with Dr. D. During this time of the coronavirus pandemic, she is a sought-after international panelist and global speaker on mental health and on post-traumatic growth. Recognition includes South Africa's most influential woman in government and business and the lifetime achiever of CEO magazine, the ABSA Jewish Achiever, Cyril Harris Humanitarian Award, Rotary Paul Harris Award and Professional Speakers Association Educator Hall of Fame. Dr. D, that really does speak for itself and we're so grateful to have you here today. So um, the format of today is I'll hand over to you. You have some questions that have come through from our support group. And uh, when you get a chance to answer those, that would be wonderful. It's lovely to have you. Thank you very much. And it was a great pleasure. A very, very welcome call. You know, I just think that the, these kind of challenges that we're dealing with on an ongoing basis, like, um, like dementia and especially being caretakers and family members of people who are suffering dementia are there all the time, but have just become extremely exacerbated. The challenges have become exacerbated during this time. Thank you for that um, CV. Yes, you know, there's a lot of stuff on there. I guess the thing that I associate most with um, and that is of value to me is I had a very interesting and valued relationship with Nelson Mandela over very many years. And the recognition of making a difference to the nation, which is the quote that he, um, he sent me, is what I try and live up to making some sort of difference, being the difference that makes a difference. And therefore, if I ever get calls from organizations like you, who are doing exceptional work on an ongoing basis, it definitely is a privilege for me to be here and to step up and to do it for you. So, you know, people are talking about the global health crisis. We're back in the middle of it, right in the eye of the storm again now with the third wave. Certainly for me, and I think for a lot of us, that was unexpected. We would hear about the pending third wave a little bit, but it was kind of a bit distant. It was outside there. Outside there for many of us has become inside here now. Nobody knows. There isn't anybody who doesn't know someone who has been affected by it, and it's everywhere with a real vengeance. And so it's regenerated all of that whole cycle that we went through from the beginning, even the cycle that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross actually spoke about in her grief stages, we're seeing globally, not only individually, and it's re-emerged and it's re-emerged differently now. So what I'm saying is that there isn't only a health pandemic. I'm here to tell you that there's also a global a a mental health pandemic. And this is being felt individually, relationally in families, in terms of our partners and our families. Certainly it's affecting us very on a, on a huge level, unprecedented level socially and globally as well. So, you know, it's I didn't think that I would be saying on a webinar, you know, we back to going through some of those real stages that we saw in an unprecedented way in the beginning, but it's actually made us face some of that again. And I'll tell you what some of that really means. In the beginning, there were some very forward thinking organizations and companies who anticipated 
not the extent, but anticipated the challenge a little bit anyway, of the challenge that we were going to face going into the pandemic. I mean, right in the beginning, I'm talking about round about February of, of last year. Um, in fact, of the year before now, we're talking about, yeah, no, last year, not this year, last year. And one of those organizations, um, I will tell you, was Investec, who contacted me and said, you know, our doctors who are clients are going to be called upon to be in the front lines of this. We want to make sure that they understand that we are partnering them in some of the challenges that they are going to have as much as possible. So in addition to the construction of certain financial packages and preparing for the fact that they may have to be isolated from their families in anticipation, they also said they're going to need some partnerships, some tips, some holding, some understanding of what they're going to be called upon and what they're going to have to do and the effect of that psychologically. And in the research and preparing to make videos, there were three four minute videos that had to be prepared for this. I started speaking to some of these doctors about how they were feeling, what they were most anxious about and what they thought their unique challenges around this pandemic were going to be. And without fail, and I remember the conversation particularly with one of them, he said, you know, Dory, it's going to be the uncertainty that is going to dominate everything and act as a springboard for so much that is going to emerge. And he was so right. What did he mean? This particular doctor had actually been a doctor at, uh, on 9-11 in the States. And he went on to say that as traumatic as it was, and of course we all know that it was, with over 3,000 people losing their lives, they knew what they were dealing with. They knew that it was coming to an end. They knew how many people were involved. You couldn't get sick from it as a doctor. They were confident in their treatment methods. Certainly, although they had to confront loss at that time, if people were hurt and still and, in, and possibly recovering, they did what we always do, and that's you call the closest members of the family who come in and they're there and they step up and he went on to say, listen, I imagine with the huge contagious nature of what we're dealing like is we going to have to be the family. People will not have closure. Their family members won't even have to be there, which of course is undeniably traumatic for not only the patient, but also for the family. So he started highlighting all of the differences that we were going to see in this pandemic and every single one, of course, proved to be more real and very, and very extensive based on all of the uncertainty. And it's come to re-emerge that um, over and over again. If we were able to say to all of you, okay, look, guys, you're going to have to go through this. We will go through this, but it's two months and it's going to be done. The difference in how you respond you know, and how you, you plan is just immense. People don't even know what the future looks like. They don't even know when the future is. And I have to say that in the beginning, when people started talking about the new normal, new normal, not that long ago, you know, that came kind of with one of the last stages of the morning life cycle, which I'll tell you about. Um, and that was acceptance. Look, we've got to accept. You know, I, I kicked back on that. I said, I'm not talking about the new normal as if this normal is here to stay. I want to talk about the now normal. It's here for now, and that's how we've got to deal with it. Without really anticipating that the now normal is very now, 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 and is pervasive and carrying on, which is resulting in people just going through those stages again. So let's just say that one of the one of the good thing, if there is any good thing, um, that it, there's a lot. There's a lot of meaning that people are taking away. You heard in that introduction that I've been talking a lot about the prevention of post-traumatic stress and the promotion of post-traumatic growth. In other words, have there been any lessons? Have there been new priorities? What are they? Can we sustain them? 
to improve our present and our future? Is it possible to not let suffering go to waste? And indeed it is. And I may be able to address that a little bit towards the end of it. But I mean, to think of, of really what has been happening based on this kind of huge springboard of uncertainty, the emotions that have been elicited. Well, I said there was a good thing. The good thing is that the mental health span, pan, uh, stigma as we've known it has really been thankfully eroded a little bit, which means that people are talking much more freely about mental health. You know, not expected things like, you know, we know what you deal with is a discrete entity and people were always not comfortable. It's not a comfortable thing, but it was accepted to talk about something like Alzheimer's and the challenges that went with it were to not quite understood unless you were doing it, but kind of it wasn't. But to talk about I'm depressed or I'm scared or I'm not coping or I've become withdrawn or my frustration tolerance is extremely low, or I feel guilty because I don't have patience, or you know I never put up my hand to be a teacher, I'm really a mother and I'm not coping with it. Or you know sometimes I just can't help it, I act out in the most unprecedented way. We know that gender-based violence has increased exponentially, the divorce rate has increased. There are a lot of issues that are going on around with kids not having been able to socialize, very important for children to play. Um, people are working, I don't even say from home, I say with home. You know, there are no role definitions and all of that anymore. And because people are saying, okay, you know, we all in the same, we in the same boat, I often say in South Africa, look, we're not in the same boat. You know, we're in the same storm. I don't know anyone who it's not affecting in some way or another. And that kind of makes you more a compassionate member of the human race. You look at people and feel comfortable in saying, okay, how are things going down with you? And you really mean it. It's not the hala how's it that we used to do. The conversations are a little bit more in depth and they're a little bit more real and there is more concern. So I'm saying, okay, that might be something slight that we can hold or not so slight, important that we can hold on to from a you know, from that um, point of view. So it is sort of normalizing it, but as I say, we're not in the same uh, boat, we're in the same storm. There are some people in our country with the parity and so on that we have, who kind of attempting as my, they're not immune to loss like everybody else or to infection like everyone else, but some people are on rafts that may be broken and other people may, might be more, you know, on an ocean liner, so to speak, which makes coping with it a little bit, a little bit more easy. So the stages that people that have been precipitated, what, what are people going through? Well, we're now talking about not only global warming, like we still do, but also global mourning. And the global mourning is a reflection of the stages of everybody. So there's been huge losses and mourning and grief comes with loss. What are the losses? Well, of course, the first thing is loss of life. Absolutely, a, you know, huge loss of life. And that, and that has just thrown people, it, there's never a good time to cope with loss of a family member. But I mean, people in their prime, young people, people who didn't even have comorbidities before, where people are losing, their, are losing children in a way which, in the scheme of the world sort of was never really meant to be. So, you know, the loss, the grief that is associated with loss of life, then there's loss of jobs, there's loss of money, there's loss of predictability based on this uncertainty that I've been talking about. There's loss of, of, of routine that we used to take for granted, sitting around a table with a family. I don't know about you, but I know that in, a lot of the people that I am associating with now are really treating it almost like the lockdown in the beginning right now. Even though you are allowed to go out and there are um, limited restrictions on level three, just because of the fear that's been generated throughout the communities and all these letters that we're getting about the fact that the healthcare system is overwhelmed has really made people stop and take stock and say, you know, 
you're going, this, this is proper. And they're also realizing that they might, we might be in it, partly because of too much of a cavalier attitude or because of COVID fatigue, that people would just wanted to get their lives back. And so there's loss of physical contact. There's isolation. And I think a lot of you, with your parents and with people that you know, and particularly vulnerable people, you know, who are not well to start with, have to, these people have to be isolated. And the effects of that isolation, you know, the, have absolutely taken its toll. You know, we are wired for connection as human beings. Human beings are wired for connection. And it's one thing to spend time on your own out of choice, you know, needing to be by yourself. It's another thing to not have the choice and be forced to have to deal with this. And people, um, the effects are depression, absolute depression, huge, huge anxiety about it, frustration and feelings of uncertainty in terms of people who have to care about these people, particularly elderly parents, and just not knowing what to do. Also, the problem with that always is, is that the carers, you know, here's the thing, the carers are also members of the human race themselves. So the feelings that are generated in them to do with their own kind of short fuse in the face of it on normal feelings, normal to a very abnormal situation. These feelings that you are feeling or that other people are feeling going through this are actually expected kind of responses to a situation that is traumatic. And that's quite important to say because you can turn around and say, I'm losing it, you know, I'm really getting crazy. I can't, you know, it's getting to the point where I just don't even want to see this person because I get triggered, I get triggered so easily. And then when you don't see the person or show up and maybe you can't even physically, then there's overwhelming guilt. And this is all kind of contained in a bubble of love, of deep love that is there no matter what, but is generating all this kind of roller coaster of extreme emotion. And I can tell you that that is absolutely understandable. So it's very, very important, you know, to be able to name these feelings. But before that, I just want to tell you what those grief stages are, though some of you might know them. And we've seen them globally, we've seen them individually, we've seen that those grief stages that were described that long ago, and another one that was added to it not that long ago by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's colleague, I'm trying to think of his name, Dave, begins with a K, gosh. Oh, I'll think of a Kessler, David Kessler added one and not that long ago. So the, the expected things in the face of grief, and boy, has there been grief. And we're seeing it globally and individually. Is first of all, in the beginning, there's quite a lot of denial. And that's what we saw again now. Only a couple of weeks ago, we were warned about the third wave. People were, and but we wanted to be in denial not wanted to be, we were in denial because the facing of another onslaught, which we have to face now, was just too horrific. The shock of it, please, can we just get out of this? I want my old life back or, I know, I will, I, I, and the denial is actually quite useful in a way because if there's a loss and it's usually associated with, with death, these kind of stages, it prevents you from the full onslaught of the shock. You know, you in denial a little bit, which serves to numb the shock. Has this really happened? I can't really face it. Or if someone is really ill, to not see it in its fullness sometimes is useful for a little while. It's not useful on an ongoing basis because you have to own the story eventually. You have to own the story, especially if you're going to define the ending differently. But the, that first stage certainly helps. And then there's also the next thing that she often spoke about was that there was bargaining. And bargaining is we're seeing it again now with people being sick, you know, in this third wave. People bargain. They bargain with themselves. They sometimes bargain with other people. And they definitely bargain with the Lord. Definitely. 
They don't often tell you, but they do. And they'll say things like, please, God, please, if you just let them get better, just let them get over with, the, with us, please do. I will be the, a, better, a, a, a better child to my mother. I will be a more mindful caregiver. I will not, you know, just um, lose it as often as I do. I will be the, 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 a better parent and more caring. I'll become more religious or whatever you think that you need to do to be a better person. And that kind of, those sorts of internal dialogue, you know, and those kind of conversations are not uncommon where you kind of set yourself up and do a deal. Do a deal with yourself, do a deal with other people or, or with the powers that be comes into it. And then, of course, there's always anger and people are very angry now. And where do people feel angry most? They feel angry because they're out of control. Anger and out of control comes together. And I think one of the lessons that people have had to learn in a very harsh way is that not everything is in your control. You know, I deal a lot with, with executives especially with senior executives. And I mean, they were the ones who often used to say, oh, for goodness sake, you know, don't be a wuss. If the circumstances suck, then just change them. You know, I'm in the driver's seat of my life. I can make things happen. And to a very large extent, they and we can. I think that we do generally give up too easily. But this has been a wake-up call of unprecedented proportions, where the rug has been pulled out from under us and we know that there's a certain amount that we can control. So we're not saying that we're completely out of control. We can control our responses to some extent. And that's partly what you're doing now. You're listening because you're wanting to know how it's all very well to say all of this. How do we deal with all of this, which we're getting to now? How can I control my responses? How can I prevent myself from getting too low or too scared or too angry? that I can still be functional. So that has to come into it. But certain things like what, you know, especially on a large scale aren't always um, under your control. And I've spoken to a lot of people who said, you know, you know, there, there's this balance between destiny and control. I used to think that everything was under my control. And now I think you know, I know that it isn't, and it's made me more humble and perhaps more compassionate in terms of other people as well. And then, of course, you know, you get to the stage of real sadness, and that's when people are facing the reality of what we're going through. And you just need to look at statistics and the overwhelming effect on the healthcare system at the moment. That's reality. That's fact. That's not catastrophizing in your head. That's not ruminating in your head. And when we do that, we tend to do that negatively. You know, we hold on to the what if negative thoughts. A colleague of mine always says the net, it's a negative bias. The negative thoughts are like Velcro. The positive thoughts are like Teflon. Teflon. You know, it makes us unrealistic either way, either being unrealistically, be positive, be positive, be positive, be positive. They're, they're fish swimming in the canals of Venice or the skies are blue. You know, there's a problem, a real problem with saying be positive all the time. Be optimistic is different. That mindful optimism, that realistic optimism that says, because it's true, look, this too shall pass. We have to hold the space and let's talk about how to hold the space. That's true because I don't believe or I choose not to believe that this is going to go on and on and on and on and on forever for the rest of our lives. That's okay. But to try and say to people, don't talk like that, just be positive. You know, uh, it's just a bad day that you're going through. We all do that. And we all do that because we want to make ourselves and other people feel better. And what that does sometimes is it shuts people off. It doesn't give them the space to sit with you where you listen, you listen empathically, you listen to understand, not to respond. You listen to give the person the space to own their real feelings. And it really is very, very tough. You know, it must be so difficult when you can't see your children. Tell me more about that and what it feels like without jumping in and trying to take it away too much. 
So what we say with that is that if you name it, you can tame it. It's the first step. You lean into it with people who really care. Now that's extremely, extremely difficult for people who are deeply connected to you. Because when they talk about what they're going through, or when you are a witness to it, it's almost like you're going through it as well. So the protection and the default mode of wanting to move away, even get the hell out of there, you know, as quickly as you can, once again, is a normal reaction to a crazy situation because it affects not only them, you feel them, you connect it to them deeply, you feel that so deeply that it's like you going through it as well, but it's very counterintuitive. It's not people's default, but you find that if people feel heard and they feel listened to and they feel supported and understood, rather than pushed away too quickly, it, it helps exponentially. So, you know, that part of the, that, that um, is very important, that acceptance. And then, as I said, there was a last stage that was added to it by David Kessler, and that was only in 2017 when he lost a son himself, who was 21. And he said, there's got to be something beyond acceptance. There has to be. I'm not, it's not just coming to terms with. And he came up with the importance of finding meaning. What, what does this all mean? And for him, what it was, was the meaning was the lessons and the legacy and the value and the magic moments that he had experienced during his son's lifetime and what he could internalize so that his son would live inside him. But what actions then, what could he do that would take parts of the good that he experienced into the world, how he would be, that it gave him meaning and it gave him another little bit of a mission to kind of maintain some of the things, the benefits that he got out of it as well. So the problem is that you can't find the meaning too soon. You have to go through the morning first to, to really find the meaning. And these stages we're seeing again now all mixed up, lots of denial, lots of anger, lots of it wasn't mean, then a kind of sense of resignation and other things. We're seeing a great deal of fear and anxiety. You know, how is this going to pan out? So if I say to you, okay, the stigma has been flattened a little bit, you know, does that help you? No, not really. All I'm saying is that please be accepting of yourself. Do not come down of yourself. We don't want to add shame to these feelings as well. If you add that second layer of shame, I'm not strong enough, positive enough, good enough, good enough parent. I'm not something enough. I'm not a... You know, I see other people are coping better than I am. And you do this comparative bit. But you adding another layer where you're coming down on yourself, which means that not only have you got the feelings to deal with, you've also got the shame to deal with. And the problem with dealing with that shame is that it puts you back in a very lonely space because it means of not feeling good enough. The next thing is, what if they see what I'm really like? What if they see that my thoughts are dark? What if they see that sometimes, you know, I actually am not superwoman or man and I don't cope? And that alienates you even more, more and more and more. So it's very important in going through this to find what we call your tribe. Your tribe can be a tribe of one. Maybe they're more. Um, in your life, and you're lucky if they are, but those are the people who will not be an echo chamber, who will not just um, echo you and, and do comparative and say, oh, well, you think that was bad, let me tell you about what I'm going through here. It's different from resonating with you, maybe sharing an experience that is connecting with you, but it's definitely not, it's, it's being able to be present with you in the moment, with their senses fully receptive and making sure that what they hear is what you intend to say and creating that feeling of safety that there's trust and that I can tell this person anything. Now, the thing is that if you get that kind of empathic listening, the shame goes away. 
Now there's research to show that. Many of you might have heard of Brené Brown and the wonderful work that she does. She's done incredible shame research and empathy research. And she shows that if you kind of um, symbolically put, put shame in a Petri dish, the I'm not good enough, the intense feeling or experience that you're not really worthy of love and belonging. There's something about you that if they had to find out or that you don't recognize yourself, and that's coming to the fore now because everybody's meant to cope better with everything. You know, if you put that kind of feeling in a Petri dish and you doused it with empathy, with a kind of understanding, um, a listening to understand, not listening to respond, the shame goes away. And it's obvious why. The person is accepting you. They're understanding. They're accepting you for where you are. You leave feeling. with feeling, gosh, you know, I'm a member of the human race and I'm of value instead of this alienating feeling that makes you hard away more of not being good enough. So for you as carers and as support people who have family members and you as well who are going through a challenge, you have to look after your parent's child. You have to look after your husband's wife. You have to look after your colleague's colleague or boss, as the case may be. What I'm saying is that if you do not cut yourself some slack and practice self-compassion to quite a large extent, you're doing not only yourself a tremendous disservice, and you might say, but I have no time, but other people need me, especially women who are reared to be nurturers and caregivers. And the problem with that is that I promise you, if not now, but sooner rather than later, that's going to backfire on you because of the buildup. You start resenting the very people who you're trying to be nice to. If you don't set boundaries, don't fill yourself up with things that you might want and need from time to time. And you have to take away the all and put an and in it. It's not them or me, it's them and me. And how do I organize my life? What routines can I have? What can I build in? Am I taking care of myself well enough physically from a nutrition, sleep, and exercise? And most especially planning in, if you keep yourself not only sane but calm, You'll be better for other people. And you're also saying to yourself, I'm a deserving too. And when I talk about this, I think of, you remember the days we used to fly? I haven't done that for some time. You know, in those machines that had two wings and someone who sat in the front and made announcements. I somehow remember that back in the day. But I do remember that they used to say, put on your own oxygen mask first before you take care of the needs of other people and children. You, you have to, you can't be deprived of oxygen and then help other people. So you have to, as Karen, now what would help for you, you know, as that? I mean, first of all, very often when we, I've said to you, okay, it's normal, but there are times that people need help. And there are two signs that I say that you do need professional help. First of all, you don't leave it for too long. If you're going through peer by periods, I mean like even a couple of days, everybody can have a bad day every now and then. But if you're feeling low such that it is um, impeding your functioning, like you can't work properly or you have to withdraw from relationships that you were engaged in before. So either too much aggression, low frustration tolerance continually or too much withdrawal on an ongoing basis. It's the extent and duration of these things. You might say, have to say to yourself, look, it will be useful to kind of seek some help and talk to somebody else, those two signs. And then what happens um, when these things manifest? Well, what happens, and this also came, and I'm acknowledging the role that what I learned through working with these frontline doctors but that happens with all of us. They would often, quite often, and as doctors, you have to be very calm. And they're not good at, at dealing with shame because, you know, they have to be in control. They have to know everything. People look up to them. 
So it's very hard for them to admit, geez, I don't have all the answers or I also need support. Or you know what, I'm just having to choose at this time between the oath that I made and I will show up. I'm also so concerned about my family at home, you know, all, all of those things. And sometimes when they were triggered or panicked dealing with someone, who they really felt just um, whatever I do isn't working and they're not going to survive. They also have this tendency at times, they, they have learned how to keep calmer, but we all catastrophize or ruminate, you know, what if this, what if this, what if this, what if our heads become like an internal train. And then how do you stop that? Because what happens is that the primitive brain has kicked in. Your emotional brain, the amygdala, that overtakes any capacity. The degree of oxygen and blood that flows through you then out of um, affects the neocortex of the brain, which is the executive center, the adult part of the brain that enables you to think. So when you are too emotionally hijacked, you can only react and not respond. And the reactions are fight, flight, freeze, those sorts of reactions which might have been useful back in the day where you had to say, I'm going to either eat or be eaten. But, you know, right now, the, ch the chances are that it's going to serve you better if you can stop that train of thought. If you recognize, ah, ah, this isn't happening. Stop. See a big red stop sign. Count to five. Forwards. Count from five to naught. Backwards. You know, your grandmother used to say that she was wise. It didn't come for any. Get yourself into the gap between your thoughts and in the gap you can think. And you have the chance to respond rather than react. To say, hang on, this isn't serving anybody. What are the facts? What are the real facts here? Not what are my perceived facts here? Dari, you have coped with trauma before. You've got resources. You can get this. You've got resources. Ha, huh. just calm. Get some help if you need it. If you were telling a friend how to deal with this at this time, what would be some of the things that you would tell the friend? That's called decentering. And these kind of things, deep breathing, a lot of people are talking about just take some very, very low deep breaths. In the moment, and they do, they tend to calm you down in that moment of, of being too reactive and not responsive enough and catastrophizing. So the thing is with these kind of feelings which are generated by all of this, counterintuitively, as I said, if you don't own the story, the story will own you. Which means if you don't understand what you're going through, if you don't have the acknowledge the healing power of some sort of support, even a support of one, which doesn't need to be a professional person, it can be a real friend, where you don't practice self-compassion and cut yourself some slack, or realize this is very real, very, very real that you're going through, and there's a lot of shoving under the carpet, such that your carpet starts looking like the Alps after a while, I can tell you, you're going to act out, act in, you will hit the tiniest trigger, just one thing that will happen with your parent, with your pe person who has Alzheimer's, or with someone in your family, which will be a trigger for everything else that you've been pushing under the carpet. And you're going to tend to react, you know, in a way that you don't like and that you will feel guilty afterwards. So it's important to do what I'm talking about is keep your space clean. If there are unresolved things and it's impossible to resolve them, perhaps with the person that you're dealing with, you need to talk about them to a very hearing, empathic person elsewhere. If you can deal with unfinished stuff in a calm way, not in a blaming way, it's good to do it, to have clean space, clean space as much as you can inside yourself and clean space between the people that you that you're dealing with gosh I see the time I've been talking I do hon on sorry I've been talking for a long time I just want to say and then I'll end and take some questions 
uh, that I've got here, that there is some meaning to. When I deal with all of these CEO groups, I say to them, what's the greatest impact of the pandemic on you? And besides all of these losses and the negative things, many of them have said there's been a priority shift. One was funny, said I was just aware that there were a few short people in my house before that. He said, you know, I met my children. These are my children. Hello, children. Where have you been all the time? I don't even know who you were. I've spent time with my family and I understand the importance of that now. I want that to continue. A lot of people are talking about gratitude, a renewed sense of gratitude. Sometimes it's because of, of some survival. Sometimes, most often, it's because of connection of the support and connection, which may have always been there, but they didn't value as much as before. You know, they're really, really valuing it now. Some people say, I'll get a better balance between what is and what isn't under my control, so I'll be more humble than I've been before. Other people say, I'm definitely going to be more of a participant in the human race and just, you know, understand the plight of many other people, as well as myself, um, a lot of times people talk about a re-evaluation of time and how they want to spend their time, most especially of what is and what isn't important. So there are some good things which we hope will sustain. Maintaining some sort of optimism, not necessarily positivity, because the positivity is often serves to say people, I don't talk like that. Don't talk like that. You are allowed to talk like that. You don't have to feel at this moment positive all the time. It's okay to not be okay. You can be despondent. It's fine. It doesn't mean you're not hopeful for something better in the future. No. And that kind of mindset is really important. I had it a lot with some of the people who'd been in the struggle. I met Katrada. And I said, how did you ever cope with those years, you know, being incarcerated? And he said, you know, we were still fighting the struggle, but just from a different place. We weren't giving up on the fight or on the struggle. Viktor Frankl, who I had the great pleasure of listening to when he was in South Africa all those many, many, many years ago, when he spoke to a large audience, he just stood up, I remember, and he said nothing. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, I was very young very new speaker, and I thought this man's forgotten his lines. He hadn't forgotten his lines. He just looked at the people, and he said, the reason that I survived the concentration camps was you. He'd been in the concentration camps for three years. He said, I've never met you before. I've certainly never seen you before, but in my dreams, I said these words a thousand times, and he maintained that belief of, okay, this isn't great is shocking of what we're going through you know but I believe that you know together we'll get this and we'll we'll come out of it a little bit differently face the challenges in order to come out of, of, of it a little bit differently so thank you everybody I hope that some of that was useful to you and I'll answer any of these specific questions I've been sent some but let's open it Karen I don't know if you can hear me and yes, let I me know what you want me to do from now. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Morning, uh, Dr. D. Morning, Dari. Um, uh, I think that uh, you've really put it into a, into a perspective that we can all understand. Because, you know, I think being a carer for somebody um, that lives with a dementia day in, day out, it's, it's that enormous feeling of loss. So I think that, you know, what we're experiencing as you, uh, um, you know, likened it to uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, I mean, very much like that. Just the one question that, I, that I'm wanting to ask is, is that um, how do people integrate back into society after lockdown, um, bearing in mind that we're now sort of hitting the third wave? Yeah, look, I think that it's the most excellent, thank you, most excellent and timeliest question. Because as you ask me that, the, the, my kind of um, literature and what people are writing about is a new syndrome, Karen, it's called re-entry anxiety. And people are actually recognizing that there, there is pervasive difficulty and anxiety in getting back. 
So, you know, people have become, I mean, sometimes they've sort of lapsed into a routine, you know, of being at home. I can show you, I'm not going to show you, but you can say to me, you know, what are you wearing below the belt? As I sit here in front of my Zoom, and I'm wearing sheep on my feet because they're comfortable and you can't see them. So that kind of work, you know, is you, you can't step out. You know, there are a lot of challenges, much, much more importantly than what people are wearing. How is it going to be? You know, how will I reintegrate again? You know, some people are caught at a time in their lives where I'm thinking of my son. He started a new job and he's never met his colleagues. It's only been online now. So that whole thing of get, of integration, orientation, getting to it has just been skipped by him. You know, he's just been thrown into the work. So I think the, the, the kind of what I can say to you is the best practice of it is to use some of the things that I've said. Number one, understand that there is going to be anxiety. There's going to be too much emphasis on celebration of getting back without enough um, recognition that it's also going to be tough getting back mm. into reconnecting with your friends, into, into your old life. I think there will be a lot of necessary and understandable celebration, but also to be able to say, what do you think your challenges are going to be? Or let me talk to myself about what I think my challenges are going to be. How can I recognize and face these challenges? Will it help if I don't just say, okay, this is gone next um, era, if I you integrate slowly? You know, will it help if I reach out to colleagues and say, are you also feeling some of these things? So that you don't feel crazy and alone and you understand that you're not the only person to do it. So once again, it's all that in order to embrace it, you have to face it. There isn't a shortcut to it. And facing it means acknowledging of vulnerability. I haven't used that word yet. I'm surprised because I use it a lot. Vulnerability and authenticity. And that you are that it, if, you know, you, it's okay. And it's real. Vulnerability is real. You, you know, you, 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 it's no good hiding all of that fear and um, anxiety. And you can't selectively numb. So you want to not come across as, as being scared or anxious or even sad or uncertain or whatever. So you put on the armor and you step out and you say, look at me. But the armor is heavy to carry around. And the problem also is that if you numb those feelings, you numb everything. You also numb the capacity for support and love and creativity. So there's, there's an experimentation of how open can I be with these people. There's often a relief that you can be because they're feeling the same thing. It's a recognition of what some of the anxiety is. And it's the understanding of the healing power of support. You know, there's a nice little saying that asking for help isn't giving up. Asking for help is not giving up. Perfect, perfect. Well, I think you've you've summed it up, um, you know, so succinctly. And I think it's a it's a very important conversation that we've had um, this morning. And um, having celebrated uh, Father's Day yesterday, the father of our nation, Nelson Mandela, his words, you know, to you all those years ago. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the hope and the inspiration you offer and the difference you make to so many lives. Dari, thank you for the great contribution you make to building our nation. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, tribute to you. And from all of us at Dementia SA and those that will be, be enjoying the, the webinar and your infinite wisdom, thank you so, so, so much from all of us. Be well, be safe, and, um, and thank you so much for your, the generosity, firstly, of your time and your knowledge, um, and then also of your inspiration to us during these really challenging times, Dari. Thank you so much. Karen, I really appreciate the invitation to do this. I just want to applaud you, you know, for you, for what you're doing. And I know enough to know that people who 
serve voluntarily in this organization are doing so because they often have had their own personal experience of it. So they deeply, deeply understand and have traveled this journey. And it's an extremely, extremely difficult journey. And just to say that you never have to travel it on your own, when you've got a support group like you have, you know, it just helps absolutely enormously. And from a scientific point of view, just to end this and to tell you that science knows this, the books that are written about the healing power of support, there's one even that's called Love and Survival by a dean of medicine who talks about that if you have support and love in your life, there are physiological effects of that as well on a positive, on a positive thing. So it's been a great pleasure and thank you very much. You can call on me anytime. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, Dr. D. We appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Sure. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.